welcome to Thrive On Live. I'm Caroline Modaresi Tirani. April is Stress Awareness Month and Thursday is National Stress Awareness Day. So it's time to take stock of what's riling us up and find ways to relax. Because from demanding jobs to complicated relationships and health concerns, many of us deal with daily stress. And according to the American Psychological Association, 42% of adults say they feel like they're not doing enough to manage it. But our next guests are trying to change that. Joining us now on set are Bob Roth, Executive Director of the David Lynch Foundation, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, a cardiologist and director of women and heart disease at Lenox Hill Hospital, and Dr. Pamela Peak, senior science advisor for Elements Behavioral Health. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, you know, Bob, let's talk about stress. Uh, so, you know, how does stress encroach in our daily lives in ways that we, ha we perhaps can't see? Well, we've, we have two wonderful experts here, but I'm happy to just speak from my own experience, and that is there seems to be uh, an epidemic now of the impact of stressful stimuli on our lives and so we feel tense and we feel anxious and our minds aren't clear and this just builds and builds and builds and a good night's sleep isn't enough and is even if we exercise it's not enough we feel that anxiety we feel that build up of of just feeling uncomfortable and we can't sleep as well and so then you come along with National Stress Awareness Month and something like Transcendental Meditation and approaches like that to address it in ways that are non-pharmacological and that are actually highly effective. So it's a wonderful topic and you have two great guests. We do have two great guests. Yeah, Dr. Suzanne, I mean, talk to me a little bit about stress. Uh, you know, is it worse today than it was 20 years ago? Because I feel like there's this idea that we are getting more stressed out as a society. Well, let's think about what was going on in about 1986. This is when women entered the workforce just as much as men. And since that time, we see a rise in heart disease in women compared to men. We see an increase in heart disease and heart attacks in women less than 55 years old, women who describe being in the workforce and having stressful jobs, there's an increase in heart disease. So if we don't step back and say, listen, there's a problem with stress, then we're missing the big picture. When we talk about heart disease, we talk about cholesterol and blood pressure and diabetes and smoking, but we really need to look at the huge impact that stress has on lives. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Dr. Pete, what do you think about all of this? I mean, you know, why do you think that we are perhaps feeling like we're not addressing stress as we should be, you know, in reference to those stats that we read in the introduction? Because it's easier to run to the gym. It's easier to, you know, uh, cook a meal and say, well, that's it. So I've dealt with my mouth and my muscle. What about your mind? And then you get that glazed look and the uh, eye roll and all the rest of it. With my work at Elements, um, and specifically at the mood centers at Lucida and Malibu Vista, what I've found in working with these women is that I've got to get them out of the eye roll. And I have to make sure that everyone out there, especially women, because there's a big gender difference here too between men and women in stress, um, really get the message that the only way they're ever going to be able to recapture their health, if they ever had it in the first place, um, is to be able to integrate mind, mouth, and muscle. Just like Bob said, uh, it's so terribly important not to blow this off anymore. For instance, did you know that 50% of women lay in bed at nighttime absolutely worried? For that matter, women don't worry. They pre-worry. They worry about not worrying enough. And they sit back and they, and they just can't get to sleep. Yet, the grand majority of those very women say that sleep is integral to health and wellness. There's a disconnect. We've got to be able to address gender-specific needs here, too, because women are unique. I, I think that's a really excellent point as well. And I've got this tweet here. This is from Mar Mariam Diamond, who says, I stress about stress before there's even stress to stress oh. about. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're talk I think you're talking all of us here, right? I mean, you know, we've all experienced that, this idea of like just feeling general sense of anxiety and stress. And sometimes we just can't isolate where that comes from. You know, how do we do that better, you know, Dr. Suzanne? I mean, how should we better isolate where the stress is really coming from? So a lot of times what I'll tell my constant perseverating patients is that you got to make a list. You have to put down what, what the issues are, what's bothering you, and throw away those things that you cannot control. But this is where TM comes into play, and this is where everything needs to slow down. 
you have to slow your brain down. And the reality is, just like Pam's saying, you gotta take care of your body, you've gotta nourish yourself, you've gotta sleep, but you have to slow your mind down. And this is where TM became a really important part of me telling women how to do this because this is what TM does. Yeah, I think, you know, Bob, you know, you're the TM expert here. <laughs> so just for those who don't know, uh, Transcendental Meditation, what is it and how can it help? Transcendental Meditation is a very simple, natural, effortless technique that's practiced for 15 to 20 minutes, sitting comfortably in a chair with the eyes closed. It just looks like this. It can be done pretty much anywhere. You can do it on a train. You can do it on a plane. You can do it in a car someone else is driving. That's a caveat. <laughs> um, and what happens during the meditation is, I like to use the analogy of, a, of an ocean. We have the choppy waves, waves on the surface of the ocean, but at the depth of the ocean, it's silent. And the mind is the same. The surface of our mind is the gotta, gotta, gotta mind. The pre-worrying mind, as Pam was saying, all that. It's all the thinking and worrying, but deep within every one of us, every human being has a level of the mind deep within that is already calm already peaceful, already silent. It's there. We don't have to believe in it. We don't have to fight it. In Transcendental Meditation, we use a mantra, which is a sound that has no meaning, and we're taught how to effortlessly access that. And when that happens, our body gains a state of rest, which in many regards is far deeper than sleep. And the result is what these two women are saying and research shows, a profound repairing and release of stress and more energy and clarity. And yeah, I mean, you talk about the research showing, I've got some stats here, you know, uh, in 2013, the American Heart Association released a scientific statement in support of transcendental meditation, saying the American Heart Association evaluated numerous alternative therapies, including transcendental meditation and other forms of meditation, finding TM to be the only form of meditation proven to lower blood pressure in patients with hypertension. The study further concluded that that TM is the only form of meditation doctors may recommend in clinical practice. Dr. Suzanne, what is different about transcendental meditation that makes it the only one that doctors may clinically recommend? Well, there's research, and this is what makes this so amazing. There's actually data based on clinical analysis of transcendental meditation that when people do this, there is a reduction. Are you ready for this? Because this blows me away as a cardiologist. 48 to 66 percent reduction in heart attacks, death, and strokes. Now this is just as much as we can get from medica medication really. So when I talk to people about managing their stress through TM, this is the same idea as giving a medication and it's because of the research that has been done showing this reduction. Yeah, I mean Bob, talk to me about some of this research. Well, even before that, if I could just go back to your yeah, question, it. and that is right now the word meditation is very generic, and there's mindfulness practices, and there's vipassana practices, and there's transcendental meditation practices, and for a long time, it was a common scientific understanding that all meditations were basically the same. As long as you just closed your eyes for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, it didn't matter if you concentrated on your breath, or you listened to music, or you did TM. Well, it turns out that's not the case. It turns out research shows that there are basically three, and I'll say this quickly, three types of meditation. One is called focused attention, and that's a concentration form of meditation. That's where you try and clear your mind of thoughts, and that creates gamma brain waves. The second is a popular mindfulness approaches. Mindfulness is more of a coping mechanism. It's, a, it's great for people, but it's a coping mechanism. In the middle of the day when things get tough, you stand back, you take a minute or two, you watch your breath, you just, you observe. And that is like watching the waves on the surface of the ocean, and that creates a theta brain wave. And transcendental meditation is just, they call it self-transcending. We're not concentrating. We're not trying to stop the waves on the surface. We're not just watching the waves. We're actually allowing the excited mind to settle down and experience that pure consciousness, that source of thought, deep within restful alertness, deep within everyone. And what Transcendental Meditation is not a coping tool, it's really physiological. It really gives the body profound rest. So, I mean, do you... You know, you know Bob, one, you... Of the things, one of the things I found um, is that in working with real women out there who have a mental Cuisinart for a brain, um, they'll take a, a thought and just, it, it, they can't let it go. That's what keeps them up at nighttime and back and forth. Many of them think that if they're going to become stronger and if they're going to become, you know, better, and achieve that higher level of health and wellness, that they have to somehow hit the gym and build muscles and they have to cook perfectly and everything's with the perfect word. You know what I have taught them? 
you know, in, in, at Vista and at Lucida, what I tell these women is I said, calm is the new strong. Huh. And that means, oh, it's very profound with them. Yeah. It stops them in their tracks. And then they say, wait a minute, what's that about? And then I said, it's much more than just living mindfully. It goes deeper than that, just like Bob is talking about. And that is transcendence. You want to go to a very deep place where you can be accountable to you. You can, you know, touch yourself in a deeper place. And here's the great news. The research also shows epigenetics, meaning that you're changing gene expression when you do this type of thing, you decrease inflammation throughout the rest of the body. You're also able to dampen down a lot of the negative genes we tend to carry around with us and enhance the positive ones. And there's a residual effect. It's not like, well, okay, that was great for 20 minutes. No, there's a spill-off effect that helps you throughout the day to be able to stay on track. Women love that. Calm. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to talk about this actually because this particular this idea of the calm is the new strong because you know we live in a society that's culturally kind of programmed that being busy is a great thing. Being yeah. busy means you're successful. Having two or three cell phones, you're all, you know you're a winner. Yeah. Uh, how do we change society and kind of cultural notions of calm being the new strong when for a long long time we've heard that being busy means you're successful. Being busy means that you're strong. What you find out is you don't have to be busy, manic, crazy. That you can actually be calm and be more successful. One of the things that I used to say years ago about motivating women to exercise was even after you exercise, your metabolic rate is up. So you're burning calories even when you're not exercising. And that was a motivation. I'm going to go work out then because that means I will be thinner during the day, just conceptually. And when we talk about meditation, this idea, just like you say, Pam, that you can meditate, but there's a hormonal shift that happens throughout the day. So instead of living with the manic energy of three cell phones and being on a computer, you actually can feel a restructuring in a sense, that there is a way of rethinking about everything that allows your calmness to be more focused, to be more directed, and to allow you to think instead of half finishing or half completing well, a thought. Well, I want to actually don't repeat one second because I've got to... Why with that hormone thing for a yeah. second? Suzanne, you're, you're so right. The two hormones in question, let's talk about women. Yep. Estrogen decreases with the higher levels of cortisol, this is which, right. is, which yeah. is stress hormone, so that when you're able to control stress hormone, and which with its new best friend, adrenaline, because they go, they're yeah. secreted hand in hand, then estrogen actually rises. Your ability to be able to maintain a more normal hormonal milieu is optimized the more calm you are. And you could all you have to do is read the Harvard Business Review. I mean, come on, everybody who is really in the know and got the message that running around busy, busy, busy and, and running your cortisol through the ceiling in your fight and flight response through the ceiling is getting you absolutely nowhere. If anything, it's very negative on overall productivity that instead calming down and strategically using your energy and balancing it with that calm as a foundation throughout the day is the way to go. Yeah, I want to read this comment from Rona Barry Morin, who's watching, and she says, you know, it seems like we've been talking about stress so much lately, it doesn't seem to be making an impact, and lowering it to a manageable level. So, you know, the lowering, I think, is what she means. But, you know, Bob, I mean, how do we do that? You know, you are somebody who's extremely successful. You know, some of the people that are now uh, proponents of TM include the likes of Russell Brand. You've got some very famous names associated with this. These are all people that are either in the public eye, lead very, very stressful and demanding jobs, uh, and, you know, deal with what one imagines to be a great deal of stress. How do they see the benefits of TM? I think that there's a, we've reached a tipping point here. I think now I used to, I've been teaching Transcendental Meditation for over 40 years. And for a long time, you know, the interest in, in TM and meditation in general was just sort of marching along on a horizontal plane. And I would say the last year or year and a half, and I think part of it is the work of these two wonderful women, the, the interest in, in TM has just spiked. And I think there's three reasons. I think the problem of stress is more all pervasive. It's not that we're just more aware of it. It is. We're, we're, we're plugged in. The pressure is 24-7. Second, um, modern medicine doesn't offer, offers no magic bullet. There's no pill that you can take to prevent 
stress or even to cure it. You can mask it. And third, science. So there's a tremendous, as they've been saying, amount of research on transcendental meditation so people are open to it. And you mentioned some people, or how people are integrating this into their lives. And that is busy people recognize that the trajectory that they're on all of us included, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And I was going to say yeah, that hey, hey. we cannot go through life sprinting because eventually there's fatigue, there's burnout, there's adrenal compromise. It's a mess. Life is a marathon. You have really got to pace yourself because you will burn out. You will burn out tails on your on your cells the telomeres and i think that that's a great point suzanne because at the end of the day what you want to be able to do is extend high quality longevity you can't do that what we already know is that at toxic levels of stress that means stress associated with helplessness hopelessness and defeat which give you those hormonal issues at those levels you're not only flipping into negative gene expression but you're also foreshortening um, the telomeres which are the tails of the cells, we don't want to do that. We want to elo keep those elongated as long as possible. So now in science, we have some elegant ways and unique ways to be able to actually measure the return on investment for being more calm. Yeah, and the other piece to that is that when we look at people who are stressed, they tend to have other issues like being overweight or obese, yeah. like having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these other Well, things. I think that that's an excellent point. And, you know, I want to read just some of these stats just so people kind of get a sense of what we're talking about here. American Psychological Association released more detailed statistics on the detailed ways that women and men process stress. So in the past month, 40% of women felt nervous or anxious compared to 29% of men. 38% of women felt depressed or sad yeah. compared to 25% of men. And 35% of women felt constant worry compared to 20% of men. I mean, that's remarkable. It goes back to that tweet, doesn't it? The stress upon stress upon stress upon stress. Uh, you know, Dr. Suzanne, why do women and men seem to at least identify or at least they're a bit more aware of how stress is impacting them? A lot of what I hear, women are juggling a lot. There's a lot on their plates. It's not just about the job. And as much as we'd like to believe there's more equality amongst the sexes, the reality is the woman tends to be the caretaker of the home and the family and be in the workforce just as much. There is a list, a to-do list that goes on and on and on and on. And there's an element of being a woman, of trying to be perfect in every aspect of her life. There's no ball to be dropped. And so that understanding and perception is on the forefront of her mind at all times. And she's aware of it. And I think women, and I say this all the time as a cardiologist, women are heart-centered. Women feel things a little differently than men do. And so we feel the stress. We feel the anxiety, and it becomes part of us. So, I, so what do you do then, Dr. Suzanne? You're in the middle of the day. You've had a, a huge caseload, and then all of a sudden you can just feel yourself getting stressed. You're like, I just, I can feel it. You, it's that sort of horrible, uh, you know, the, the emotions running through your body. You can actually feel it physically. How do you deal with it in that moment? You know, it's interesting because, by the way, I am no different than any of these women that <laughs> are tweeting right now. And I really came upon TM because I really felt uncomfortable in giving my patients higher doses of medication. You have high blood pressure, you're so stressed out, your blood pressure is going up. So I give you a blood pressure medication, but really the stress was the issue. So in seeing the research out there that came out, as you mentioned, through the American Heart Association in 2013, I said, okay, this is a solution. So I went and did some research on my own and learned TM on my own. So now in my own life, I have this tool that when all that craziness is going on during my own day, I actually stop. And I, mean, I sit back and I'll do that moment, that five, ten minutes of a little TM in my office, and I come out a much better person. Is that what you do, Bob, as well? <laughs> I mean, you know, what do you do in the middle of the day? You mentioned the sort of three different strata, different, very different types uh, of meditation and mindfulness practices. Do you incorporate them all during the day? Well, I, th I, think, I think we all do. I mean, I think in the middle of when something's crazy, you do want to step back. Uh, what I, if I could say, just for a moment, I think what's lovely about the research and what's being talked about here is now 
meditation for so long had been misunderstood. Oh, it's a religion. It's a philosophy. It's difficult. I could never do this. It's mysticism. I don't want to join an organization. All the sort of, the, I could never do it. You know, oh, I'd like to, but my mind is so busy. I mean, I've got a gotta, gotta, gotta mind that you just out of control. <laughs> and I could never, I go to a yoga class, and at the end of the yoga class, I'm supposed to clear my mind of thoughts, and that doesn't happen. You know, my mind is, and so I feel bad about myself. And I think what we're seeing now is understanding meditation that involves transcending is that it can be learned instantaneously. It can be learned within an hour. I mean, it takes an hour a day over four days to learn TM, but within the first hour, you've got it. And then what happens is, then you do it in the morning. It's not an escape. It's a preparation for the day's activity. So you carry that calm over, and both of these women were saying, doctors were saying that. The purpose is a preparation for activity, not just an, oh God, I gotta break away from this. Yeah. But now I carry that calm and that wakefulness and that creativity. So give me a practical example, Bob, then. Give me an example where before TM, you'd have been in a situation and you just wouldn't have felt that kind of calm going into a meeting, for example. <laughs> I, or... I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this since I was 18. I've been doing yeah. it for 45 years. So all I can say is, for so long it's been part of my life, I would just say that when a stressful situation comes along, and then I want to hear a stressful situation comes along, I feel it, but I bounce back faster. Well, actually, I was going to say, do you, I was, yeah. just before I get to you, Dr. Suzanne, I mean, have you ever fallen off the TM wagon? Has there ever been a period where you lapsed and then you've kind of come back on, or is it just almost impossible to No, do that? for me, it's like brushing my teeth. I, I, it's not like a discipline anymore. It's just part of my life. Oh, if I'm going to be busy, crazy busy all day and I travel a lot and I have a lot to do, well, why wouldn't I get up 20 minutes earlier and meditate? Because what an investment of time. 20 minutes means... 10 hours of laser-like focus, and not a nervous energy, but a, a focused energy. And I'm sure these two wonderful women have something Yeah, Dr. Add. Suzanne, come on then. What, what do you do? Oh, Dr. Pete. The easiest things i found, and in working with the women that I do, is this. Um, always remember this. Stressed, spelled backwards, is desserts. And so when you say, what do you do before, you know, the, what was the classic default place of self-destructive behavior? Oftentimes, women are out there, and by the way, their DNA shows that they're much higher risk for anxiety disorders than men, which is why your statistics are not surprising. What women would oftentimes do is self-soothe, and the easiest thing to self-soothe with is basically junk food, and that's what they do. And once you start into a meditative practice, and um, I know Bob very well, and um, I have definitely learned TM as well. Um, it, one of the things you find is that in that inner sense of transcendence and calm, you're able to more likely draw upon executive function and to be able to say yes or no. Because what's also interesting in research done about um, transcendental meditation specifically, they found that when you're in that restful alertness phase, that the circulation to the prefrontal cortex, which is the smarty pants part of the brain right behind your forehead, sort of the CEO or executive function resides, the circulation actually increases. And this is one of the reasons why people who do um, meditation on a routine basis actually feel creativity increase. And this is something I know that David Lynch has, has experienced over many years um, and other people who have done this on a more regular ritualized basis. Women could so benefit from being able to tap into that to be able to be, not only achieve higher levels of health um, but also to change from the default mode of self-destructive behavior, to be able to take that pause for a moment, which so many of my women who learn meditation have experienced, and to be able to say, no, I'm choosing differently. That's yeah. something meditation is. I think that's a really good point. I well, we're running, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I know, I'm so sorry, we've just been told we're running out of time, but Dr. Suzanne, okay, what go for it. I want to... Huge wanna... point. Here's the big difference. You go from uh, reacting emotionally to reacting very thoughtfully. And that shift changes everything. So during the day when something happens, instead of saying, oh my goodness, I say, it's not so bad. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I mean, Bob, you know, finally, I guess, your, your message to people out there that are still just not sure about TM, they don't know if it's going to help them or would impact their lives. What would you say? Research, you need more knowledge. Find out for yourself. Yeah. No one should ever push you into doing anything, but you should have knowledge. And when you, you can go to davidlynchfoundation.org or even better, tm.org. Look at the research, find out what people are saying about it, and make an informed decision on your own.